All right. So uh, this I thought was very interesting. I've been concerned about whether they're going to cancel DEF CON because I go to DEF CON every year. It's a really big thing for me and a lot of people do. And I'm going to Black Hat now. And I don't know if they're going to be canceled. And I was very pleased to observe today, Dark Tangent, the organizer of DEF CON, made a statement. And this matches exactly what I figured out yesterday myself, which is you look at China. You never heard about this virus until January. And now it's the end of March, and now it has peaked, and it's coming down, and they're beginning to reopen the businesses and reallow travel. So probably in another month or so, it'll be back to pretty much business as usual. So if it's the same here, uh, we didn't hear, then we start here, it starts happening now in March, so April, May, June. So he said, he chose June 1. He said, by June 1, then we will know enough to either cancel it or not. This thing will either have calmed down by June 1, or it won't have. And so on June 1, they will announce whether they're canceling DEF CON or not. And that way, you still have enough time to make your reservations and everything. And uh, that seems very sensible. By June 1, th this should have calmed down. And if not, then obviously, we need to keep canceling everything. But I mean, you clearly don't want to keep canceling everything forever. <laughs> and the, all the, all the uh, experts say two-thirds of us or half of us are going to get it. It's going to spread. You can't stop it forever. All we're doing is holding it back for a few weeks. So instead of having a giant peak and overwhelming all the hospitals, it'll be smeared out. And then the people that really need to get in hospitals will be able to get in. So it, we're not preventing it. We're just delaying it by a month or two at most. And so within a month or two, it'll go around like the cold and everyone is going to get it. We'll get it. And hopefully then we'll be uh, able to resume normal life and it will just be one of the many diseases wandering around that doesn't totally disrupt everything. That makes sense to me. Um, there was some guy, um, some government official said, he was mad about the stock market, said, well, if you just make sure everybody gets it right now to fix the stock market, because he's an idiot, because then the people who are really sick couldn't get to the hospital. Then a lot more people would die. Scaring it out gradually gives us all the best chance. Anyway, so Microsoft had a, another flaw in SMB. This is their file sharing protocol. It's been spectacularly vulnerable for 20 years. SMB version one had a ton of hacks. Then they brought out version two that had a bunch of hacks. And version three has a vulnerable bug. In general, if you're using Microsoft file servers, you should not be exposing them to the internet. This protocol has never been safe enough to expose to the internet, which is true of a lot of Microsoft fundamental networking protocols. And so very few people do because SM1, P version one and two had so many volumes. And now there's a wormable SMB3 volume with I think severity 9.8, which is pretty much the maximum, which means anybody can come in without authentication and run code, I think even as system. So, but now they have a patch. So uh, if you shouldn't be exposing SMB3 to the internet, but if for some stupid reason you are, you should at least patch your stuff. But in reality, that should all be behind a VPN or something. Anyway, um, all right. Uh, this one I thought was fun, but it doesn't work in this browser, so I'm going to cruelly abuse the, uh, the free trial and use a second browser. Yeah, this one. So uh, this is the Department of Water and Power in Los Angeles. And I thought it was pretty interesting. They um, got raided by the FBI. And what happened is they hired a security firm to do a security scan of their network. And they found huge, monstrous flaws. And they found that they had been covering them up and falsifying documents to appear to be in compliance when they weren't. And it, they then kicked them out and refused to pay the bill and said, you're lying. Those vulnerabilities aren't really there. And so there's now a lawsuit and an FBI investigation around this. Um, it's all very, very believable. As you know, the same thing happened at this college a while ago. We had a crooked CTO that claimed it was the opposite. He claimed we had a huge vulnerability that we didn't have. And it went to the press and everything. And we had to prove that we didn't have that problem. But this is the problem with cybersecurity. It's uh, people are afraid of it. They don't understand it. And so there are a lot of false hoax claims made for and against it. But most everybody, if they haven't been real serious about cybersecurity, they're extremely vulnerable. Unpatched stuff, default passwords, and everything else. Your first scan is always a nightmare. It's years to clean up the first batch of low, low, scan, low hanging fruit. All right, and... Uh, well, they're just having investigations and lawsuits and stuff, so nobody knows what's going to happen. Uh, most government agencies, though, are spectacularly out of compliance. Uh, like 98% of them or 90% of them when tested are not up to the government standards. They've decided the standards, but nobody has given them enough money to actually meet the standards. So it's not surprising at all that they have serious security holes. And it is good that they begin to scan and fix it. But usually the response to the old establishment 
of the first scan is to just kill the messenger and say, oh, don't bother me. It just means a whole bunch of work. And, I, and we're doing okay. It can't be that bad. There's, nobody ever wants to hear it. Like the Pope. You know, the previous Pope was pushed out because he was covering up the sex abuse. The new one also was covering up the sex abuse. I mean, authority figures never want to hear bad news. They just want to say, shut up. Everything's fine. Stop complaining and we'll just go on as we are. Anyway, so, and I'm surprised to hear this. Now a uh, judge has said, not the judge on the case, but some other judge has said he thinks Amazon has a very good case to win the defense cloud service. This is JEDI. It stands for something. The JEDI is the American military moving to the cloud. And the decision was made that the entire military will move to one cloud provider. And they put it out for bids. And everyone assumed it would be Amazon because Amazon is by far the most mature cloud provider. They have the most experience, they have the most products and the most capacity, but Microsoft competed and won. And Amazon is suing, claiming that Trump intervened to force it to go to, um, to Microsoft because he hates Amazon because uh, Jeff Bezos owns the Washington Post. And apparently this case has some merit. And if they win, this is gonna make a huge difference. Right now, Amazon is number one, Microsoft is right behind them at number two, and all the rest are down in the small change, at like a few percent. And if, and if Azure was to win, they would become number one. And if Amazon was to win, they would have a commanding lead ahead of Microsoft. So it's really big in the cloud space. And by the way, almost all the podcasts I hear from like real uh, corporate executives say, everybody is really going to a multi-cloud solution now. They use Amazon and Microsoft and other ones. Almost nobody really sticks with just one cloud solution. And that's one of the questions about this. When it came out, they said, why in the world are you using one cloud provider for the whole military? Why aren't you spreading your cloud across many? Anyway, that well, uh, that is an interesting question. Um, I don't know. I would say it probably has less chance of small hacks and a bigger chance of total disaster. But because the whole thing could go down easily. The other way, you have more exposure. Like somebody was asking me um, this about why I use a password manager add-on to my browser instead of the default password manager. Because that one is tied to the operating system. And the operating system is this big sprawling mess where they keep adding more stuff and have a huge attack surface. The little password manager attachment is just one thing. So I think it's safer, but it is not that simple. Anyway, so I think we uh, might as well get down to it. Um, so here we are. So I assume everybody knows, but if you don't, this is the last physical class for this semester for anything at the college. Tomorrow. Um, no, I think forever, unless they've changed something. I don't think they're coming back to physical classes at all. Only for two weeks. They're going to have physical class again? Yeah. Oh, well, then something changed. All right, let me see. Last I heard, they were going to cancel for the rest of the semester. Maybe they finally, this didn't make any sense, by the way, because many of the face-to-face -face classes can't possibly get online. So let's see. This is um, from March 12. This is today. Okay, something has changed. Well, let me see. He said, they're suspending until March 30, I know. Then he said, uh, online, well, bef well, I don't know what's going on. Well, I'll let you know if they tell me. The last I heard is there'll be no more face-to-face -face meetings for the whole semester. That's what I got from one of these earlier ones. Now I, so maybe there will be face-to-face -face again in April. Well, that would be nice. Um, I will, if I get any actual information, I'll put it on my website up here. Um, anyway, so for the next two weeks, you no know, face to face classes, but I will have online classes next week, which is when spring break is not, I'll continue this way. And uh, then comes spring break, March 23 to 30. It won't be any classes then. Anyway, um, well, I hope they open up the college again for physical, but I think to be fair, they don't know. Just like everybody, they're waiting to see what happens. This will either spread a lot more and they'll have to keep it shut or it will calm down. I don't think there's any chance of it coming down in two weeks though. In two weeks, it's gonna be burning hot. I don't think they're gonna resume class in two weeks, but I'm just guessing. But I think, I'm just looking at what happened in China. It was rising for two months. And we're just at like, what, 20 deaths now. Yeah. Yes, so I expect it to grow bigger and faster and further. It's going to be a lot worse. Yes, I think so. So I think in two weeks, they'll be shutting it down even more because people will be more panicked. I think so it'll be right months. Now, right out here, it's moderate, uh, Italy. Italy is yeah. like 10, 10 days a month, uh, you know, 10 days ahead. So Italy is jumping. So like, yeah. 
yeah, realistically, I don't think they're going to be less panicked in two weeks. So I think they're going to keep it closed for longer than that. But I haven't heard an official word, so I guess I don't know. Anyway, certainly the next two weeks, and I will put it on my website and, and uh, let you know whatever I can find out. That's, of course, the big issue. Anyway, so um, for two weeks, no face-to-face -face classes anyway. And I, uh, but this class, our schedule is we are here at um, 9B. And then we'll have a class next week. Oh, I forgot. I'm, I'm going to move this holiday up here. Spring break moved. So we'll meet next week online in Zoom. The week after that is spring break. And this lecture will be down here. I forgot to adjust my schedule. So 326 and 42 will flip. That's the only immediate change in the schedule. But these meetings will all be by Zoom and not physically until further notice. And I would assume probably until the end of the semester, but I guess I don't know anymore. Something I thought that was for sure, but I guess not. Anyway. So we're here to the second part of attacking data storage. And this is where we talk about more details of these data attacks. You've already done quite a bit of SQL injection, especially if you did the extra credit projects, which is a very important attack and very good to learn for pen testers. And you certainly don't want to let it happen to you. And here we're going to talk more about defenses. So what a lot of people do is they block apostrophes or something. It's certainly blocking apostrophes would stop the most common, simplest kind of SQL injection, but it doesn't stop them all. For example, you can find ways to sneak in an apostrophe character without typing a literal apostrophe. So it gets past the filter and is later interpreted as an apostrophe. Um, for example, you can use the CHR or char function where you don't type an apostrophe, you refer to it by its ASCII number. And therefore, the filter will not find an apostrophe in CHR parentheses 109, but later on when it's actually implemented, that will be interpreted as an apostrophe. That's one common trick. Um, this is why, by the in general, in all of security, whitelisting is considered a very poor security practice uh, because, um, well, excuse me, blacklisting, blacklisting this is, where you try to enumerate the bad things and remove them is dangerous because that means you just have to disguise the bad thing to slip through the filter. Whitelisting is considered much better, where you only let good characters where they're actually used be in. Then any kind of weird encoded version they fed in will be stopped. Anyway, so uh, they might block the comment symbol. Remember we had this apostrophe or one equals one dash dash to make a comment signal. And that would work because this would be select star for the users or name equals blank or one equals one. And the rest of it would be ignored. So that would be fine. But if they blank, if they block the dash dash, you can't put in the comment signal. So that's why this one is nicer where you don't need the comment signal apostrophe or a equals a. So that it creates a complete phrase and uh, you do not need a comment to complete the phrase. And it's still a condition that's always true because A equals A. Uh, if they block select, a lot of, you can have filters that will just remove the word select. So you can just put in variants of select. And a, a null byte, put in select twice. So when it removes one select, it forms another select. Uh, put it on an ASCII. There's various ways to do it. And that's why simple filter just has one line of grep. Remove all the selects or something is not impossible to get past. Um, if they block spaces, then you can use plus signs for spaces, or you can use comments for spaces. You can even put comments inside the keywords, and that will block the keyword filters you're looking for select and so on. All these, that's why, in general, trying to enumerate bad things and remove them is a losing battle for web pages because there's so many ways to encode and alter data so they will not match your filter, and yet they still will have the same result. And then there's second order SQL injection. You might be able to inject data, which does not cause SQL injection when it's injected, but when it is used later by a different statement, it causes SQL injection. So you, if you register an account with an apostrophe in the name, then it can store that in the database. And the official way to do this in SQL is you put two apostrophes. So the name is stored with two apostrophes and use two apostrophes to represent one, which is a common trick in Unix command line in a lot of places. So this is what would be stored if you registered that name. But the problem is if that is used later in like a password reset, then it will select password from users where username equals foo, and that will be interpreted as one apostrophe, and now you have a mismatch and cause a syntax error. So the fact you're still vulnerable to SQL injection using apostrophes. And the fact that you use some kind of trick to put apostrophes in does not mean they won't cause more trouble later. This, I think, is why a lot of uh, websites don't let you use special characters at all. Because once they're in there, it's hard to deal with them. This indicates that they don't know how to write their code very well. Because if they used um, objects instead of this kind of storage, we'll get to it later. If they used uh, proper parameterized queries, this would not be a problem. Anyway, 
So you register, you could now all I have to do is register a new user with a name like this. And now when you do a password change, you'll get an error message. And this one here, you have select password for your username, this is the administrator password with an apostrophe in it. And when it tries to do the query, it will now give an error and the error will give you the administrator password. Error, a lot of the, uh, instead of you getting the result right away, you get it later. But the error will now interpret that string and put it there. So uh, now these are attacks where you can see the results. The simplest ones, the ones we did in the projects are where you have like a, a name search function and you can see some names. So you trick it into putting other data in the name column. So that's one way to do it or put it in an error message. Um, but you can do other things. Even if you cannot see the results of the query, you can do things like shut down the server with a shutdown command or destroy tables. You don't need to see the results, but you can tell it worked. Um, and you can retrieve data as numbers. For example, if the only thing you can get is numbers, the field is a numerical field, then you can't put things like a password in there. So you'll have to use like ASCII and substring to turn the characters you want into numbers one by one, and then just print out the numbers. Um, so this is what you would do. Uh, substring of admin one one returns A, starting at the first character and being one character long. So now you can do ASCII of that 65. So this will give you a number for the first character of the administrator password. So you could see that even in a numerical field, do an injection that reveals that. Uh, then you could look for an out of band channel. Uh, sometimes you can write a file someplace that you can see in a web browser, that would be easy. More often you have to have some way to send networks back. By the way, this is a huge problem. This is how China got hacked in 2000, got caught in 2010 when the Chinese government hacked into Google to steal their pen register database, which they had set up for law enforcement so that China could use it to track down Chinese dissidents. They got caught only when they tried to sneak the data out. They did not get caught sneaking malware in or running malware, but they got caught when they tried to exfiltrate the data. It is quite hard in a modern corporate network, once you've stolen data, to get it out because none of the servers are allowed to make outgoing connections. And that's why in the Splunk class, we're talking about this, there's a boss of the sock. The first thing you do is you find the outgoing connection from the web server, which is wrong. Web servers should be servers and never clients. And you shouldn't even allow them to be clients but if they are, that generally indicates some kind of abuse. And that's why once you have stolen data, it's hard to get it out. So here's the issue. How do you make a network connection out? Well, it turns out in older versions of MS SQL, you could put in this thing, you could specify a server and connect it to another server. Um, and this would add something to try to connect to a remote database. Oracle has the ability to make an HTTP request or inside Oracle. So you have UTL HTTP request to a URL. So now it will connect to a server and it will send up there some parameters. So it's going to send to mdattacker.net colon 80 and then it's gonna put this. So it's gonna send, if you start your listener on the server, you could run a real web server and look in the log, but if you just run a netcat listener, you'll just see the raw request. And the point is this tries to fetch a folder and the folder name is in this case, the administrator username. So like username from users where row number equals one. 3% 3D is equal. So this sys right here is the administrator username. And it's sent to the web server as part of a web request. So even though you didn't have something you could see on the web page, you were able to exfiltrate some data. Um, you can make a DNS request. This will get a host name, which will do a DNS resolution. And now you put it before you, it's the administrator password dot MD attacker dot net. Resolve that. So you run a listener on port, a DNS listener and it will then try to feed administrator password.mdattacker.net. So looking at your DNS logs, you'll be able to see it. Um, all right. You can do the same thing in MySQL. Uh, we did this in the extra credit projects, if you did them. Select data into an out file. You can write files on their server, and you can write files to a remote server. Here he's got a Windows share that will go off on the internet and then to a share and print out the file. And I've also done this by setting up a PHP listener, again, They'll set up an SMB share on their server and expose it to the internet, which I certainly wouldn't do for commercial purposes, but for attack purposes, it's all right. And now they will do a write, be able to write a file up there, and that will include the output of the command. So that's another way to exfiltrate data. Uh, sometimes you can get the ability to execute shells. If you're able to put up a PHP shell like we did in the SQL injection project, then you can use things like TFTB, mail, telnet, FTP, um, other ones that command line commands that send data off. Um, all right, and so let's take a look at some cahoots, 9B1, which is favorites. 
favorite cliche, 9B1. And this kind, and this kind. recording. All right. I think everybody's in by now. Let's do it. All right. So which one will expose a secret in an error message? As the first one, this will try to compare one to a string, which will cause an error and it will print out the string, and the string is the administrator password. All right, there we go. And which injection works when comment signals are blocked? Comment symbols. that one all the time. All right. All right. And which one will bypass a keyword filter? Okay, that's it. You remove select, but the end result is you still have select. All right. And there's a comic strip. Mom named her child this. What kind of sequel injection is that? That's second order. You should give the name. They're able to enter the name without error and save it. And when they try to use the database later, it self-destructs. All right. So I'm okay. Good. here. So, all right, then there's blind SQL injection. That's the term for when you can execute SQL commands and they run, but you cannot see the results. So <clears throat> if you're not able to get one of those out of band channels, like a DNS or an HTTP request to send out the data, then you can still deduce the contents of the database from second order effects. Uh, so here, if you go to the usual one, if you're able to put in admin apostrophe dash dash, you would then be logged in as the admin and you can just see that you're logged in, even though you don't directly see the output. So that would be obvious. But, um, all right, but here, that means this username will log in as admin and this one will not log in because where username equals admin and one equals one is true, 
where one equals two is false. So you can now have a true and a false condition. So I can add this string one equals one and one equals two. I can now ask it a true or false question. So I can, if I can see a difference between these two, like for example, one of them logs in as admin and the other doesn't. So I can tell which one of these two conditions happened. I can now take the one equals one and one equals two and replace it with things like this. So ask you some string admin one one equals 65. That question is, is the first letter of the administrator password a capital A? And I can get a true or false answer to that. So now I can ask true or false questions and I can slowly build up information about what's in the database this way, guessing the letters of things I want one by one. And that's also in the extra credit projects if you did that. So here's one that will cause an error. You select one over, one over zero, this will crash division by zero. But the select will only happen if the condition is true. If the condition is false, it will not attempt to do the select. So if the username equals DBS NMP, um, if you're able to select a username and then it is equal to DBS NMP, that means that is the administrator. So if the administrator name, if the account has really got this name, the condition is true, and then it will evaluate one over zero and give an error message. So it's another way to ask a true or false question and tell by whether it creates an error. So here's the thing that will tell you if a username a -A 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 exists or not. If that username exists, you'll get an error. If it doesn't exist, you will not get an error. Divide by zero error. Uh, now you can try time delays. MS SQL has a wait for command that will wait five seconds. So you can just see if the username equals SA, then wait for five seconds. So you'll be able to tell. They take longer to respond. Uh, you can ask yes, no questions. I can ask if the letter is at if the letter is A, wait for a delay, and the one that is correct will have a slower response. You can test single bits with the power command and the bitwise ampersand. I can do it bit by bit if I want to, instead of just going up the ASCII numbers. Uh, SQL, of course, has the ability to express questions like what is the third bit of this character. Uh, other, there's other ways to make delays. You can use sleep in some uh, database functions. Other versions, you can use a command called benchmark. There's often some kind of command that will just take some time. In Oracle, there's nothing that deliberately causes the delay, but what you can do is make an HTTP request to a server that is not there, and then there will be a timeout, which will slow it down. So it has the same result. And uh, so this is one that will cause a timeout if the username equals that. This whole second row gets the username from the database where username equals this, and if it equals that, then it was able to find it. So if it's true, then it does this. It tries to make an HTTP request to a non-existent server, which will slow down the response. All right, and so uh, you can do more beyond this, of course. Uh, if you can, you can get, now SQL injection directly lets you steal the data in that database. But I've seen plenty of cases. I've tried reporting them and stuff and nobody cares. I found some colleges, major universities had like a library with a SQL injection in a database, but the only thing in there was like a library books anyway. So who cares? You didn't have credit card numbers or passwords or anything. So you might think it doesn't matter, but the point is you might be able to find other data in there. there. Might be other databases on the same server, or you might be able to pivot to the OS the way we did in the projects where you put a uh, PHP shell on the server, and now you can actually get server commands and curve it around. You might even be able to put malware on the server and then use the server as a staging point to attack other devices. So it's, it's still a poor practice. And of course, this is the point of IoT devices. I mean, people first hear that light bulbs and their electric refrigerator is vulnerable. They think, why does that matter? Because who cares if someone takes over my light bulb? But it's still a point of entry into your network from which they can then attack other things. All right, so uh, that's the point. You can actually take data um, and extend the database functionality. By the way, we'll look at this. You can, if the database is a modern or lockdown version that removes the dangerous methods, you can just turn them back on. This, by the way, is mostly how you avoid Microsoft defenses. We're doing it in the exploit development class. Microsoft has a bunch of defenses to stop attacks, but you can just execute Windows API calls to turn the defenses off. There has to be some way to turn them off, and there often is. It is like malware. There's malware that will turn off your antivirus and so on. So an MS SQL used to have this version called XP command shell included by default. So you could just execute command lines in SQL. That was very handy. Um, now it's not that commonly there. There are other ones that let you do registry read and registry writes right from inside SQL. Um, now they're disabled by default, but if you get the database administrator, you can just turn it back on with a command and then you've got XP command shell again. It's still in the software, it's just disabled by default. MySQL will let you load a file 
and you can do out file to write a file. So this will create a table and put plus plus in it, and then it will write that table into this file. And that is the file that controls what IP addresses are allowed to remotely connect to a Linux server. And if you put a plus plus in there, everyone is allowed to connect to the server. So this is the SQL commands that will open the server to remote logins from everywhere in Linux. All right. And then there's exploitation tools. So the automatic SQL injection tools for the brute force the parameters, um, just try putting apostrophes everywhere and so on. So it finds a SQL injection point. Then it will um, add various characters. Then it'll try to do a union attack to find out how many columns there are. Maybe this um, select one, select one, one, select null, select null, null. Then it'll find a column with the variable chair card data type so it can put any kind of data in it. Then it will inject queries to jump out the data. Then it will try Boolean conditions, like um, to see if it can find a blind SQL injection, where something true and something false have a different result. And then it'll try time delays. You are automated tools that will do all these things, like SQL map. And so there's a couple in the extra credit project you can practice using SQL map. SQL map is what most of the pros use. It's a little bit tricky. They have these somewhat long command lines, but it has, it's a very nice automated attack tool. And it will try all the usual stuff in an automated fashion. And of course, it'll work like a champ against simple vulnerable databases like the ones we have in most of the projects. All right, the only thing, of, there's one, one trick in that project is I have one of them behind Cloudflare and Cloudflare blocks some of these attacks. So you have to modify your SQL map and use some of its evasion techniques to get past Cloudflare. The Cloudflare web application firewall is not very powerful. It's not that hard to get past. Anyway, that's it for one, we're up to two. All right. We had more than 12 last time. Oh, yep. Yep. I assume that's Caitlin, but I don't know. Caitlin is, in fact, like self quarantine because somebody at her workplace had it. But I don't really know. Last night there was someone pretending to be Caitlin and the real Caitlin, you know, these fake names. This is the problem. You never know who anybody is on the internet. All right, I'll give it a few more seconds. Which one makes a file? Into out file, of course. Okay. All right. Which method lets you ask a yes or no question? Additional errors, all right. There we go. And which one exposes data from local files? All right, that's loading a file. All right, and which method lets you inject Windows commands? Yep, XP command shell, just like it sounds. All right. Steve Hahn. Right, and Colin Drum wants to tell me who they are. 
that you? Okay. All right. If they care about the points, they'll have to tell me. And this might be with this chat message is. Okay, good. All right. So I'll put them up here. Good. All right. Good. Thank you. All right. So let's do another section. It looks like everything is pretty much right on time here. So talked about that. Let me get this uh, message off the screen. All right. Okay. So if you want to block sequel injection, of course, the simplest thing would be to just block apostrophes and that will stop the most common type of attack, but it doesn't stop them all. If you're injecting into a numerical field, you can just put in the or without an apostrophe and it will work. So you don't always need apostrophes for sequel injection. And of course, if you allow them, but doubling them, then you can have second order vulnerabilities like we mm -hmm. talked about. Uh, so stored procedures, people often talk about these for any SQL injections, but they don't do it. You store a procedure, you define a function called register user that has Joe in secret, and then uh, it doesn't really prevent SQL injection because those parameters end up in a line of text that is still, is still interpreted, so you can still execute commands inside there. Stored procedures themselves do not prevent SQL injection. They're just another way to write your, what stops it is parameterized queries. And the point here is the input data from the user is put in a parameter, which is a data structure, which is not parsed in a line trying to match apostrophes. So there is no way the data structure can be misinterpreted as a command. That's the point. This is what everybody should be using. So here's the normal vulnerable code. You, the query text is select ename cell from employee where ename equals quote. Then you put in the data from the user. Then you add a quote here. And that's what the vulnerable type is. There's data in the middle that came from the user. And if it has quotes, it will misunderstand it. That's the SQL injection code that we've been exploiting here. So the parameterized version, you just have select where ename name equals question mark in there. No quotes, no single quotes, no nothing. There's just a placeholder for question mark. And then down here, you define a parameter object, which includes the name from the user. So this way, what they can, this is the right way to do it. Now they could give you apostrophes, you could store them in a the database and use them, nothing bad would happen, as long as you do this everywhere. You have a well-defined data object that is never misunderstood as a code object. All right, so you have to, of course, use parameterized queries for everything, not, not just the ones that are obviously user controllable because wherever it got the data from, the user might ultimately have been able to affect it. And uh, you have to be careful with other things. And the one defect of SQL is you can't use it for other parts, like order by and sort, which also might refer to something from the user. So uh, it's not possible to perfectly patch it in that regard, but um, it's much better. So for defense in depth, you should also have low privileges, not database administrator privileges on the running service. So if they do find a SQL injection, they won't be able to do as much with it put on vendor patches, remove uh, unnecessary procedures, and so on. So that that's what you always do. And so then there's no SQL. This got a lot of press maybe five, six years ago when Facebook announced that we're going to use Cassandra. This idea became popular. The original SQL databases were designed for finance. So you'd have something like your credit card balance, and all these people are making queries, and you always have to get the same numbers. So everything has to be synchronized. And if you have multiple servers, they all have to have 100% identical data. And the idea of NoSQL was maybe you didn't really need that. Maybe if you put something on your Facebook wall, it would be okay if it sort of gradually percolated around the world and didn't simultaneously synchronize everywhere. And maybe that would save a lot of time. Most people I've heard decided it really didn't. But they did develop these NoSQL databases. And so it, it doesn't require as structured data, and you can arbitrarily define keys and values. Uh, and a lot of people are jumping on it, especially Mongo, which I think is NoSQL. It's a big one, and it's really popular. Anyway, so you can look things up by key or value or XPath or with JavaScript. So here is what you do to inject into Mongo database. Mongo is connected to JavaScript. And so you declare a Mongo database, and here's the function, which will find username and password equals username and password equals password. And Dolly's username and Dolly's password came from the user. So down here, you'll do find um, if it is, if um, you call that function here, you have a turn, there's function. So here is someplace you call function, which I'm somehow not seeing here. Um, but anyway, you call that function some, oh, JS, here it is. This dollars JS is what calls that function. And that is what determines if you're in. So it goes to see that, and then it determines whether this is, you're logged in or not with this function. This 
has a injection on the JavaScript side. So if you inject with Marcus slice slice, then the function turns into this username equals Marcus and the rest is ignored for slice slice being a comment. So it's a similar kind of SQL injection. You can inject into Mongo, at least when used by um, JavaScript. And I think it also applies to Mongo in general. Here's another one. You can use these double pipe commands to put in a series of, of uh, conditions and JavaScript will interpret the first one as being applied to the username and the second one is applied to the password. So this will log you in as the first person in a database. Um, this is the equivalent of that or one equals one dash dash that we often talk about. You can inject into XPath. XPath is an XML based database. So you have this structure address book starts there and ends here. And then you have addresses that start here and end here. And each one has first name, surname, password, and so on. It's just a structured way to organize data, which is extremely popular. This is the way all Microsoft Office documents have been stored since I think 2010 or so, 2012. Um, so you are XPath queries, and they look like this. This will retrieve all email addresses. Address email, give me all the text of all the emails. All the information about DAWs would have text equals DAWs. Give me information about that user. The brackets have the condition, like where you, your surname equals DAWs. So this is the data to print out, and that's the condition in the brackets. It's just another format to express the same concept as the other SQL. And so here's an injection. They will retrieve a stored credit card number from a username and password. So you get the address for the screen equals DAWs and password text equals secret. Um, and then you get credit card and text. So this is how you have password protecting stuff. But here's the injection, which will um, have an or A equals A here, which will always be true. So the password test does not matter. And so again, there's an injection. You put in the password field that will give you everything. So uh, to find these flaws, you can feed in these kind of strings like apostrophes. Those will break the syntax and create errors. Here's ones that will not create errors, but will change the results and things you could use to detect this flaw. So to prevent this, you just remove all the punctuation marks of the input data which is a common way to protect it. Then there's LDAP, which is just a way of storing databases, an older system um, used by Microsoft Active Directory and a lot of other services. And so LDAP has this syntax like this. To match a username, you just put it in parentheses. To match any of these conditions, you put an or at the start and then a series of conditions and the or applies to everything. So any one of those could be true. To match them all, you put an and at the start and then a series of conditions and then they all have to be true. And this seemingly minor change makes it much safer. So if you try to inject something, you can't inject or one equals one. The or was before anything you fed in. And you can't change it. So it turns out, just from the structure, it's pretty hard to do injection in LDAP. It's, even if you don't have sanitization or anything, the stuff you can put in the parameters doesn't really easily lend itself to this. All right. So I got some cahoots about that. And uh, this one is gone, but we're doing this one. All right. Alex J is sick or sleepy. Oh, he's wearing a mask. That's good. You know, it's smiley face in the mask. That's a good idea. <laughs> Uh, Caitlin had one the other day. They have the Spectre. The Spectre has this little ghost. They, okay. they totally, everything cool is in there. These, these uh, emote icons have ones for everything. Yeah. All right, I'll give it a few more seconds. I think we had 14 before, didn't we? So I might be two people that haven't fallen asleep yet. Then again, maybe not. I'll give it five more seconds. Yep. All right. All right, what's the best defense? 
Yep, parameters, which cannot be misunderstood as code. All right. What system uses these the ampersand at the start? Yeah, that's LDAP, Lightweight Directory Access Protocol. All right. And what system uses queries like that with the slashes? That's XPath, the XML based one. All right. And what defense might open second order SQL invoke injection vulnerability? Double apostrophes, which then enter in the database as single apostrophes and might lead to more trouble later. All right. So, oh, there's another one. Okay. Which of these is the least susceptible? Hold up, because it puts the logical condition right at the front where you can't change it. Okay, so Peter Chi is a two-time winner, and so is Gary Lynn. Oh, okay. And Phil Fry is just good. Good. All right. So I'm going to stop the recording. I'll leave the share on for a little while in case anybody has questions. And this is what I'll do for the next week.